Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I've been looking forward to it, really, because uh, especially for the feedback that I'm going to get from you. I have presented this paper to uh, audiences in the past. I presented it at the APA, actually, uh, a couple months ago. So it's not going to be very original for Amandin. Sorry, Amandin. Uh, but um, it's extra important for me to uh, present this paper to you because finally I am uh, presenting it to an audience who is already familiar with many things that I will be talking about today. Okay, so the name of my paper is Phenomenology of Non-Native Speaking, an Agential Approach to Linguistic Injustice. And I have two goals in this paper. So the first goal is identifying a number of harms that individuals may suffer when they speak a non-native language. And the second goal is showing that these harms constitute moral wrongs that are incommensurable and cannot be fully compensated. Okay, so I usually start with the background uh, and I explain in detail different kinds of linguistic justices, but uh, given that my audience is probably very familiar with these different kinds, I will just like briefly mention them. So uh, it's usually taken to be the case that there are three different kinds of linguistic justice or injustice. One among the speakers of English, uh, this is global linguistic justice because it's about the speaking of the global lingua franca. And there's interlinguistic justice. It's justice among speakers of different linguistic communities within a single political unity. And then there's interlinguistic justice and it's justice among speakers of different vernaculars of the same language. Now, in this paper, I focus on global linguistic justice for various reasons. But I have to say that some of the things that I discuss in this paper also are re relevant for interlinguistic and interlinguistic justice, obviously. Okay. So another background uh, that I discuss usually with, uh, like at, at the beginning uh, of this paper, but uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time for the same reasons. Um, it's about Philippe Van Paris's book on linguistic justice for Europe and for the world. I like to discuss this because I think it gives, like it explains the motivation, like my motivation in writing this paper. Uh, as you know, this is one of the first book length uh, um, works on this topic. And even though like, this came out in 2011, if I'm not wrong, um, this is like more than 10 years ago. Uh, it's still like one of the most important works that are that is discussed in this literature. Um, and I think that it's important in the sense that it is setting the scene for different ways of discussing global linguistic justice. So like that's why I will like briefly mention, um, like briefly explain his framework here. So uh, Van Paris, as you know, uh, argues that global lingua franca, being English, is actually a good thing for everyone in the world, both for native speakers and non-native speakers. Uh, but he thinks that there might be different ways, the different venues for injustices, and he identifies three venues as such. The first venue is the venue of this like cost-benefit analysis. So uh, if we take um, English, the global lingua franca, as a public good, then he explains that there's the question of who bears the cost of this public good. And another question is like, who takes the most advantage? Um, he identifies a number of possible costs, and then he argues that there are ways of uh, making up for these costs. And then another venue is obviously the uh, question of about opportunities because English or the global lingua franca is a, um, is a tool that people use for um, gaining like certain opportunities. And those who have this tool uh, might have access to certain opportunities that others don't have. So that's another venue for potential linguistic um, injustice. And then there's the venue of identity, like the uh, introduction of a global lingua franca um, might 
and does um, cause a hierarchy of languages. And because of that, there might be some issues about linguistic justice. Okay. Um, so I think that this is a good framework to begin with uh, in talking about linguistic justice, but it is very limited in the sense that it does not allow us to understand what really happens to the non-native speakers of English. So it does not really explain the agential aspect of non-native speaking. And this is my goal in this talk. I, I will try to show you what is missing from this threefold analysis. Um, and one thing that I want to emphasize uh, here before moving on is Van Paris's analysis about the costs and benefits of uh, the global lingua franca. So he really argues that uh, the cost of having a global lingua franca comes down to uh, the cost of learning English until becoming fairly competent in speaking English. And this can be measured in terms of time and money spent for learning English until becoming competent. Uh, but I think that this is very limited because there are other costs such as exhaustion, frustration, and alienation, which I will argue uh, constitute harms uh, by restricting individual agency. Okay, so this was the background that was very fast and uh, messy, but I'm happy to come back to that. I just don't want to um, bore you with the things that you already know. Okay. So my main argument comes from understanding articulation better. And in order to do so, I uh, draw from a philosopher, Eli Alshanetsky, uh, who wrote a book on articulation. It came out in 2019. And even though in this book, Alshanetsky's focus is not on non-native speaking. In fact, he doesn't really talk about non-native speaking. I think that it is helpful because it uh, provides us with the phenomenology of articulation, which is um, missing from the discussions on, um, on linguistic agency. Okay, so um, by articulation, I mean, following Alshanetsky, putting our thoughts in a linguistic form which can be linguistically expressed. Um, so the idea is that like, I'm not really following, I'm not really saying anything about mentalism or anything just to clarify. But uh, the idea is that like sometimes we just have these thoughts that are not linguistically available to us. And then by thinking about them, we put them in a linguistic form such that we can express it to our audience. And as Alshanetsky argues, defined as such, articulation is something sometimes effortful and sometimes effortless. And he argues that for native speakers, obviously, like he's always talking about native speakers, for like for even for native speakers, it is usually effortless, which means words just come to us without even us noticing. But sometimes they're effortful. And like when this, it is effortful, we'll have to do a back and forth until we make sure that, yes, this is what I've been really trying to express. And again, th there is this a focus on monolinguals and native speakers. Now, I want to say that when it comes to non-native speakers, and obviously I am not talking about like native-like non-native speakers, I'm talking because I think it's a very small percentage of the entire non-native speaker population. And like it takes at least like years until one becomes native-like as a non-native speaker. So um, I don't think it's a very controversial thing to say that 
uh, most non-native speakers have restricted articulation. And by restricted articulation, really, like by definition, I mean articulation with a limited set of linguistic resources. This might include vocabulary, idioms, grammar, etc. Um, in a way that one's linguistic resources do not match their conceptual resources. And by conceptual resources, I mean all the like interpretive resources one develops as they grow up as a person. Okay. Um, okay. So if articulation is a real phenomenon, which I take to be a, an intuitive idea, and if we think that non-native speakers will be, by definition, restricted in articulation, um, then we can better understand what is going on when one speaks a non-native language. And I have an example that I hope illustrates this restricted articulation. Okay, I will read this to you now. I call this Istanbul. Suppose as a non-native speaker of English, working at an American company's Istanbul office, I'm having an online meeting with my coworkers located at the headquarters in New York, and we are scheduling our next meeting. I want to point out the fact that there is a time difference between offices, since I want my colleagues to consider this as a factor. So I have an unarticulated thought that I aim to express. The earlier, the better for me. Now, I know this sounds strange, since obviously I'm coming this unarticulated thought to you in an articulated form. But I want you to think of that initial moment where I have this aim slash desire to convey an unarticulated thought, which unbeknownst to me can be best expressed as the earlier, the better for me. Also, let's assume that I have the competency to directly formulate the thoughts in English in my mind, rather than articulating it in Turkish first and then translating it to English. And this is important because that means I'm clarifying the thought in my mind as I articulate it in English. Okay. So I have this thought. I'm on Zoom with my colleagues. I, I have an articulated thought in my mind that I want to convey. And I start to think about it. So it does not come to me effortlessly. So I have to really do the articulation. But I quickly realized that I'm not able to articulate it. I noticed the difficulty and I don't really know why. And the why is in fact that I don't know the X or the Y or construction. So I switch my aim to another thought in the neighborhood. Namely, I would like to meet as early as possible in the day. Now, this is a slightly different thought than the initial one for various reasons. Maybe I feel like it is not as professional as the previous unarticulated thought. Maybe I worry that it sounds more demanding than the previous one, but still it seems to be close enough to the original thought. And hoping that my colleagues won't, my, won't take my words literally given, literally given that they know that I'm a non-native speaker, I try to formulate this sentence, but this time my grammar fails me. Instead of, I would like to meet as early as possible in the day, I come up with, I would like to meet as the earliest in my mind. I feel like there's something wrong with this sentence, even though I cannot put my finger on it. So I start over again. This time I am to express a very simple thought that I'm confident I, that I can articulate, partly because in the natural flow of the conversation, it's awkward to take 20 seconds to utter a sentence. And I decide to go with, we shouldn't meet very late. Okay. Now you might think that there is not much difference between these three sentences. Uh, and surely a charitable audience would understand what I'm trying to say. And this is true. And in fact, this is really not my point. My point is that we want to understand what happens here, right? Because in the real life of a non-native speaker, this, if, look, if I'm right, we should expect this to happen all the time. And if we want to understand what is happening here, I think we have to move beyond the question of, is the message delivered? Um, yeah, and so 
I think that like moving beyond this communicative question, we can start to identify what is going on here. And I have a suggestion. Okay, so this is my next slide. I think that there are like three things that is happening with restricted articulation. The first thing is obviously exhaustion, right? Uh, Non-native speakers are exhausted by the constant struggle in articulating the simplest thoughts as was the case in Istanbul. Here again, I'm not saying that native speakers don't experience effortful articulation or like it's always very easy for them to just like speak their mind. But if I'm right in saying that, like in, if I'm right in following Alshanetsky in saying that effortful articulation is um, not common in native speaking, but common in non-native speaking, then we can see that non-native speaking has to come with a lot more efforts. And here, I want to add something. Um, so like today, most linguists seem to be agree on the fact that our most of our daily uh, linguistic exchanges are formulaic in nature, which means that we are not really constructing sentences from scratch when we speak our native language, obviously, but instead we're just exchanging formulaic or like semi-formulaic uh, expressions with each other. And this has been shown to reduce the cognitive load when we speak, but obviously for a non-native speaker, this is not available. So like a non-native speaker will have to uh, construct sentences from scratch. And this also explains why articulation is so exhausting for a non-native speaker. And here, like, there's an analogy that I like. Um, so like, think of running a marathon, right? Running a marathon is very difficult and exhausting for everyone. But think of two people, one running the marathon with like sneakers and like the right outfit and the other trying to run the marathon with high heels. Obviously, they're doing the same thing in some sense. They're running a marathon, but the conditions are so different. Like the tools are so different for these people that we might even say that like they're not even doing the same thing. And clearly one is much more exhausted than the other. So this is one uh, one thing that might be happening in restricted articulation. The second one is frustration. So remember when I talked about Alshanetsky, I said that um, during effortful articulation, um, there is this back and forth, which ends with aha moments, where the speaker feels confident that this has been the content that they have been trying to express all along. And it marks a certain psychological state um, of mind, which brings some relief. Um, but for na non-native speakers, this does not really occur, right? For non-native speakers, articulation does come to an end but usually it's less than of an aha moment. And it's usually just a good enough moment. And I think that this constant feeling of good enough articulations or close enough articulations bring frustration um, because it means like there's no, um, there's no, there isn't this like psychological state of relief. And um, I think one, one thing that adds to this frustration is the knowledge of the aha moments. Assuming that non-native speakers are also native speakers of another language, 
they should know how it feels, how it is to speak a native language with the presence of the aha moments where one knows that they are able to like completely articulate their thoughts. So this adds to the frustration. And here's an analogy that, another analogy that I like. Um, you know, like, like think about um, trying to write with a broken arm. So when, like, let's say like you break your arm and then you have to use your other hand to write. And there, obviously it's frustrating that like you're using a hand that you're not super comfortable using. But what probably adds, what would add to this frustration is the knowledge of writing with your competent hand. Okay. And finally, um, I think there's this third harm that I call alienation and comes in two different um, ways. Um, so one way of being alienated through non-native speaking is this alienation from the world because when you as a non-native speaker when you um, articulate your thoughts the thing that you end up articulating does not really represent you fully it does not represent your linguistic character it doesn't you don't even have a linguistic character there like it's just like you are communicating something but it does not resonate with you. Um, so because like you are, you end up, you probably just end up um, expressing a, a very like flattened version of yourself. It lacks all the nuances that you could possibly um, ex uh, express in your native language. And then it also has an art, like it, it has, uh, an aspect where um, the non-native speaker is alienated from their own mind too. Because again, think about the example. If I'm right, and if this is really how it works, then the non-native speaker's mind in real time and space is occupied with these half-baked, um, grammarly incorrect sentences and like linguistic items and look in a way that the speaker doesn't even understand what is going on fully and I think this constitutes an alienation uh, from your own mind okay so if I'm right that these three things are phenomena that are experienced by um, non-native speakers um, very commonly, then we can see why non-native speaking might non-native speaking might be um, a harm to the individual agency because these are all restrictions on basic individual capacities. So they're not, things that can be easily um, made up for. And like, here's an example of a thing that could be made up for. Like, for example, like if, you know, like if I get into an accident and then my car is uh, destroyed, then I can get a new car. Um, so that's some way of, um, you know, like, providing relief for a harm that I endure. Um, but certain basic capacities are usually considered to be the kind of things that cannot be uh, violated um, in a way that it can be made up for later. And I can, I can, I'm happy to um discuss this in the q a but um here i'm really just like taking this common philosophical thought that one's agency cannot be violated in certain 
ways for no reason. And that it seems to me that like these harms do really aim an individual's agency. Okay. Uh, so going back to what I told, what I explained at the beginning of this talk, I just want to emphasize that for example, from a vampirian perspective, none of these um, aspects of non-native speaking is or can be accounted for. I think like clearly not the second or third venue, but the even the first venue where um, he told he that he has this cost benefit analysis. Um, he cannot explain these harms as mere costs because there are no remedies that can be provided to non-native speakers for the reasons that I explained. So my suggestion for that reason is to maybe move away from um, this threefold institutional way of speaking, way of thinking about non-native speaking and um, try to maybe understand of non-native speaking as a matter of linguistic agency and discuss what are the things that are restricted or um, enhanced in different linguistic environments such that some individuals can flourish better than others. Okay, that was very quick, but that's really the summary of my paper. Thank you.